everyone. Good evening. My name is Sari Kamen. I'm the Public Programs Director at MOFAD. Um, we are the Museum of Food and Drink. We're so happy to be in partnership with the Green Space this evening. So I want to thank uh, Jennifer and all my colleagues at the Green Space for allowing us to um, continue a partnership that happened in the early days of the pandemic. Maybe some of you caught some of our virtual programming. Anyone? I, I can't really see, but I think I see uh, a hand over there. Um, so we did a lot of virtual programs together for about two years online. And tonight is the first actual in-person program uh, that we've done together. So it really is, um, it's really a wonderful evening. And we all got to meet in person finally, and everyone commented how much shorter they expect, <laughs> thought I was. <laughs> um, so we, uh, this is our first event. Like I said, we have another one coming up in November. We're going to keep doing more in person, which is great. And also, we have um, we have folks watching the live stream tonight, so big hello to them as well. They're hybrid events, so hello to everyone at home um, outside of New York City or in New York City watching online. So our next event is in November. It's the third. It is uh, called This Is Not a Puerto Rican Cookbook. It's with a Puerto Rican cookbook author named Il Ilyana Masonet. Um, so she'll be in conversation talking about her family, her heritage, her Puerto Rican roots growing up um, outside of Puerto Rico and uh, this part of the United States, the diaspora. And she'll be in conversation with Eric Kim, who writes for the New York Times food section. So I hope you'll come back for that one. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panelists this evening. Um, some of you probably know Dr. Mary Nessel. I was fortunate enough that she was my professor in grad school, so I'm so honored to be hosting her this evening. She is the Paulette Goddard Professor of Nutrition, Food Studies, and Public Health at NYU. She's authored many, many, many books um, that have won many, many awards about food politics, including one called Food Politics. Her most recent book, Slow Cooked, is her first memoir, and you can, you will hear about it tonight, and then you can also buy it tonight from our friends at Kitchen Arts and Letters who are here. And then she is in conversation with Laura Shapiro, who is a journalist, a culinary historian. She, read, she wrote a wonderful book that I read in grad school called Perfection Salad. Um, she writes a lot about the intersection of gender, women, and food. And her most recent book is What She Ate, Six Remarkable Women, and the Food That Tells Their Story. So without further ado, uh, Mary Nessel and Laura Shapiro. can't see anybody, <laughs> but we know you're there. <laughs> can't see. It's great. Well, this is great. Thank you all for coming out. And uh, <laughs> Mary feels that she can't see anyone. Can't. You can see her. And the fact is, you all know her, even if you've never met her. You all know Marion. Uh, and you know her as our best source for wisdom and common sense and visionary politics on, uh, on food and health ar around the world, really. That's the Marion that we all know. When you read this book, <laughs> you will be asking yourself on every page, how did this person ever get to be that person? <laughs> it's really an astonishing trajectory. And uh, for that, it's astonishing because, in a lot of ways, this is not a food book. It's, it's a book about uh, growing up female in the wrong time, the wrong place, with the wrong ambitions, in some ways in, with the wrong family. And uh, <laughs> so it's like the whole book takes place on this battlefield where Marion has been uh, sort of hauled onto the field at, with no armor, and she doesn't even know why she's fighting. And uh, th that's the story that emerges in this book. So, so I, want to, uh, <laughs> I want to start by talking about your childhood. Oh, dear. <laughs> which has a touch of the Dickensian in it. And I mean, the mother who's always critical, the uncle whose pet name for Marion was ugly. I'm serious. Yes. Yeah. 
talk a little about that uncle and how the you dreaded survived. Uncle, the dreaded Uncle Harry. Yeah. That was the dreaded Uncle Harry. Yeah, I grew up in a, a poor Jewish family, um, and they were like lots and lots of immigrants. Everybody else who we knew was equally crude. Um, but this was um, a sister, uh, my mother's older sister was married to Harry, who I think was a shoe salesman uh, in New Jersey someplace. And that was his pet name for me. Here, ugly, um, why don't you come to dinner? That was his name for me. And nobody, everybody thought it was very funny. I did not. A lot of this growing up trauma, as Marion explains in a fabulous passage in this book, had to do with hair. Oh. Hair, in some ways, has nothing to do with food, but hair has to <laughs> everything to do with growing up female. So I would like you <laughs> to read this little bit, if you can, without your glasses, and if you can't, I will. Okay. And I've, I've penciled it out. What happens just before this is that um, Marion's been talking about this uh, kind of nightmare <laughs> childhood, and, and she's just said that uh, her father's away all the time, so she's just left with her mother at home. And mom was difficult. Uh, let's see, what am I reading here? The, the part that I penciled um, out. I was about eight when my mother's sharp co comments about how I looked and how I behaved made me think that she neither loved nor liked me. Nothing I did could please her. I viewed this situation as terribly unjust, and I never could understand it. One incident particularly sticks. When I was around five, my mother's sister, Anna, came to stay with us. At lunch one day, I said, you're older than my mother, aren't you? Anna, who must have been in her late 30s at the time, burst into tears, left the table, and disappeared behind a closed door. My mother insisted I apologize immediately. But for what? I could not understand what I had said that was so offensive as to bring her to tears. I tried to behave better, hard as it was to know how, but there was nothing I could do about my looks. My mother, who was considered a beauty, had long, straight hair. Mine is extremely fine and wildly curly, and nobody knew what to do with it. A torment of my early childhood was, what can we do about her hair? And later, can't you do something about your hair? My parents took me to men's barber shops to get it cut, and I was often asked whether I was a boy or a girl. In today's terms, I knew I was cisgender female, but I didn't look it. <laughs> An interesting passage for you to choose, Laura. <laughs> but take a look at this picture. So this is from the 70s. This is the coolest hair in the world. <laughs> It's like she grew into that. There was that one moment in history when my <laughs> hair worked. <laughs> oh. But that's the 70s. Before that, you had to live through the 50s, where uh, life was also difficult. Can I, can I say one more thing about my hair? Yes. So I walk down the street, and I get stopped by people on the street and on the subway saying, oh, your hair is so gorgeous. It's the great irony of my life. <laughs> You also say in the book, since we're on hair, that you cut it yourself, really? Oh, yeah. Mary, I this mean, is amazing. It, it's actually quite forgiving. <laughs> <laughs> and, and nobody does it better than I do, <laughs> so it's not. I, I even went to that curl place. They didn't do it either. <laughs> no. When you, when you uh, go through the book, you'll see there are some pictures of Marion's hair in different stages. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really enlightening to see it move along. <laughs> It was a big um, issue. It was a big issue. Finally, though, so you, you, you grow up, you finally get to Berkeley, which is full of people like you, hair and otherwise, <laughs> and the politics, and the, uh, the, you, it was okay to be smart. And Berkeley, in your description, sounds like kind of a paradise after what you'd been through growing up. Was it that? It was. It absolutely was. I mean, I was pretty socially inept, and I'd never dated in high school. And I went to Berkeley, met the man who was my first husband the minute I arrived, and married him two years later. I got married at 19. Um, not one of my wisest decisions. Um, but I do have two lovely children as a result. And the uh, and Berkeley was exciting. It was the time of the 
um, you know, people, it was the Vietnam War and people were, and the civil rights movement and the people that I knew were involved in those things and it was very exciting. We thought we were going to change the world. We were a little naive. You also, you also uh, went back to Berkeley for graduate school and all this time you're trying to be a scientist. You're working in the sciences and as you describe it, you're getting a lot of pushback. Well, I'm, you know, I started out, I, mean, I had all the right instincts and I just never had any support for those instincts. So I went to Berkeley wanting to study food and there were only two ways to do it at the time. You could do agriculture. I'm a city girl. I didn't get the whole agriculture thing until much later. Um, or you could be a dietitian. And so I was a dietitian at Berkeley for one day. Um, <laughs> and I went to classes, and they were home economics classes, and they were really easy. And I had this idea that if the work was easy, it wasn't worth doing. So in, I was in, we were enrolled in the same chemistry class as pre-medical and science students were. It was a five credit chemistry lab. And that was kind of hard. So I thought that's probably worthwhile. So I was a science major as a result. Um, and taking all these science classes, including the famous organic chemistry, <laughs> you know, um, which has become rather fraught at NYU. Um, and the, um, yeah, it was hard, and uh, therefore worthwhile. It was hard, and then you dropped out. So, I mean, here you were in paradise, and you dropped out. Well, I got married. And, well, right, but why? <laughs> why did I get married? I didn't know what else to do. You know, I mean, really, I did, well, everybody was getting married. I went yeah. to eight weddings the summer that I got married. That was what everybody in my cohort was doing. Everybody got married at 19, in between their, if they were in college, in between their sophomore and junior years. And I, I tell the story about when I was in high school, nobody had any ambitions because women weren't allowed to have ambitions. Mm -hmm. And so my three closest friends in high school had as their life ambitions to marry a professor, a doctor and a rabbi, respectively, and they all did. <laughs> they, di they did, uh, but I didn't have uh, that kind of ambition. And you know, I met somebody, and he was a little older than I was. And he wanted to get married, so uh, yes, everybody was getting married. That's what you did. I was trying to conform, really hard. <laughs> So let's uh, jump forward a second to the year 1963, which finds you living in a suburb with two kids, trying to do your graduate work at the same time with very little childcare. And it's 1963. This is a, an amazing year because in that one year, and actually within the same week, Betty Friedan published The Feminine Mystique, and Julia Child started on television as the French chef. So these are two kind of seismic events in women's mm -hmm. lives, and we normally think of them as two kind of separate schools of women, but you were the same school. Those two events kind of uh, coalesced in you. Well, because I was hanging around with a group of people who did competitive home cooking. I don't know how else to put it, but, you know. <laughs> I mean, we were housewives. All of us were housewives. We had children. And so everybody was cooking from Mastering the Art of French Cooking, and you know, which is not a trivial book to cook from. Um, and so that was going on. And then um, I read Betty Friedan's book, and it was like this, you know, this explosion of insight. Oh, this is why I'm miserable. This is why I'm crying all the time. This is why I'm bored out of my mind. Uh, what am I going to do? And I had a friend who um, said, you know, you really need to go to graduate school. So that was when I went to graduate school. That was the impetus for that. I was home with children for two years. It was not a happy time, though. Some people love being home with children. <laughs> I loved my children, but I needed, you know, I, they were very demanding, and I was just explaining to Sari that um, my son was perfectly happy as long as he had 100% of my undivided attention. <laughs> Not 99%, that didn't work. 100%, it was tough. Yes, you say in the book you had, I think in those years, five hours a day 
of in graduate, child in, 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 graduate in graduate school, school you, yeah. of child care and uh, and everything else fit in around that, including making veal Prince Orloff, which takes <laughs> two days. <laughs> Right. How did those competitive cooking meals turn out? Well, they were pretty good. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, if you do what she says, they come out really well. <laughs> it's just that you sit there and you think, can't you cut corners here? <laughs> you know, isn't there something I could do instead of this? And then I eventually learned how to take whatever was in the refrigerator and throw it together and make it taste okay. And that's still the way I cook. <laughs> So once you got your degree, then there you were teaching at Brandeis. Once again, you found yourself kind of beset by sort of male colleagues and male superiors and male competitors. And you were kind of squashed into a, a corner there also. You describe in those years sort of microaggressions from men. Macro! You call them micro. <laughs> you discreetly call them micro here. But how, and, you, and you say in the book that you can't really react to everything or you'd be doing nothing else. But how do you survive all the outrage and antagonism? Well, I suppose the key story about, and that's me at Brandeis, by the way, 1975. Um, the, um, I was teaching at Brandeis and you know, it's my favorite story, one of my favorite stories of all time. I got a call one night from a friend, in, a woman friend in Boston who said, guess what my women's consciousness raising group talked about last night? And I had absolutely no idea or why she was calling me to ask me that question. And she said, we were talking about your salary at Brandeis. I said, what? Why are we talking about my salary at Brandeis? And it turned out that one of the women in this consciousness raising group was the partner of um, a man who had just been hired at, um, at Brandeis to do exactly the same kind of job that I was doing. Neither one of us was tenure track. Um, and they were paying him 30% more than they were paying me. And we're talking about I was getting 8,000, he was getting 12,000 or something like that. And the, uh, you know, and, and he had been told he had to keep this secret. He had negotiated it with the department chair because he and the woman who was in the consciousness raising, uh, raising group were about to get married and they were planning to have children and therefore he needed more money. Um, and the department chair told him he was never to discuss it with anybody. Um, and she came and she felt bad about it and told the group about it. And everybody agreed I should be told. And I had been handed, of course, this phenomenal gift because this was right at the time when the women's movement was starting and salaries were a really big issue. And there were women who were uh, filing affirmative action cases and they were winning. And I knew I had an airtight case an absolutely airtight case. I had been, I was a couple of years ahead of him in experience, and um, I thought, I can win this. I can really win this. And so I just said, I don't want to make a case out of this, which was totally true. I did not, uh, but fix it. And that was my mantra. It took a year, but they fixed it eventually. <laughs> And everybody thought I had handled it beautifully by saying I didn't want to make a case of it. <laughs> and I didn't, because I knew that if I had made a case of it, uh, my career would be ruined. That would be the end of it. And what you say is that uh, that, that experience gave you a lesson that uh, sort of carried through, which was how to get things done in universities. Yeah. I know how to do that, or I did know how to do that. I'm not sure I know how to do it anymore. Which is what? You sort of come at it with the right, uh, supposedly the right attitude to be nice? Well, I knew I had to be nice. And I also knew I would win. And, you know, I kept saying, I don't want to make a case of this. And the implied threat in that was very clear. Everybody understood the implied threat. And they could see two steps ahead also and see that I had an airtight case. I, I mean, I just couldn't think of a better one. We were doing exactly the same job and he was getting lots more money and I needed that money. Um, I had a partner at the time to whom I was not married, but the assumption was that 
um, he would take care of me, I guess. I had two children at the time, and, but it, it didn't matter. Uh, so, I mean, it was, these were tough times. Yeah. You know, now I think it would be interesting to see, you know, if that kind of, that, that situation is still happening. Women are still paid less than men yes. for the yeah. same job. They still are. So even though this is now nearly 50 years later, it hasn't changed no. mm -hmm. that much. Easier to make us think about it, maybe, but um, it hasn't really changed. No, That's but a depressing thought. <laughs> But in cases like that where women are lucky, there will be a woman who comes and spills the beans at the right time. <laughs> right. So one good thing that happened at Brandeis was that you started teaching nutrition. Mm. And as you said, you kind of didn't know, you wanted to do it, but you were coming in absolutely cold. Yeah, I, the, I, the, that department, I was teaching in the biology department at Brandeis, and I was teaching cell and molecular biology. My doctorate is in molecular biology, so I was sort of bench scientist and the um, and teaching this very abstract field, um, you know, which I liked and it was fine, but Brandeis, that department had a rule that you could only teach the same course three times in a row, and then you had to teach something new because they didn't want instructors to be stale. It was a teaching department, very much. And then you also had to teach anything that, they, that the department needed, because the idea was if you had a doctorate, you were able to learn something faster than freshmen, and you were going to be teaching <laughs> freshmen. So you could, you, you know, you go teach it, even if you didn't know anything about it. And the students were asking for human biology classes. I was given a choice of physiology or nutrition. And I knew that I didn't want to teach physiology because my idea of hell on earth is trying to explain kidney acid base balance to freshmen. I just, I just can't. I can't think of anything worse to try to explain. I didn't think I could do it. And I was kind of intrigued about nutrition. Linus Pauling had just written vitamin C in the common cold. And I wondered, what was the research that showed that 10 grams of vitamin C a day would prevent colds forever? It's not there. Don't even look for it. Um, <laughs> Francis Moore Lappe had just written Diet for a Small Planet. Uh, really? Um, if you combine beans and rice, you get real protein, really? Uh, yeah, you really do. Uh, so, she, so I thought that would be a good thing to look at. And then Michael Jacobson, who was the head of S Center for Science in the Public Interest, an advocacy group in Washington, D.C., had just come out with a book called Food for People, Not for Profit, which could have been written yesterday. It was little essays from newspapers and magazines on every topic you could think of in food from agriculture to public health. It was an absolutely fantastic book. That, those were my textbooks for the, plus a nutrition textbook, for the, for the first class I taught. I had 50 students in it. They were fantastic. In those days, students could still read, research, and write papers. Um, <laughs> In case you don't know, they can't anymore. <laughs> they cannot. Um, and so it was really exciting. It was like fall. I, the way I describe it is, it was like falling in love. I've never looked back. It was just so much fun to teach. I thought it was just the best way to teach undergraduate biology. Everybody was so excited about it because everybody eats. You know? So it was a great field that you kind of uh, uh, jumped and fell into. Then your next uh, teaching was at UC San Francisco, where you were again teaching nutrition, but here it was at the absolute bottom of the totem pole. As you said, any, anything in the medical school that had to do with women or that had women in it was way down low. And then a field like food, which is all about women, was, was even lower than that. So that was just one of your many <laughs> burdens <laughs> at that medical school. Yes, well, I, I got the job as a trailing spouse, which was a kiss of death from the get-go. Um, my husband at the time was offered a very, very good position there, and I came along as part of his recruitment. And the amazing thing about it was I had, a, I had this really fancy-looking job. It had an incredible title and the most gorgeous office I've ever had. The title 
title was Associate Dean for Human Biology Programs, um, and my office was on the hill above Golden Gate Park, looked out over Golden Gate Park. I could see the ocean all the way up to Point Reyes. I walked into my office every morning and gasped because it was so beautiful. So it looked like I was really important. I wasn't. Um, I mean, for one thing, the human biology programs didn't exist, and it was my job to make sure that they never existed. Um, which I found out, and the um, and then I was teaching nutrition in the bio in the first year biochemistry course where I had some hours, and I really didn't have I didn't have a portfolio, I didn't have a clear set of things that I was doing, and so you know I picked up whatever I could, including teaching nutrition to medical students, and. Um, tried to make it work and made it work for eight years until it fell apart, which but during, it certainly did. But during those eight years, as you describe it, you also started to become a little bit of a public person in nutrition. You started speaking in public. You had a little TV show. I did television. <laughs> I, had a, I had a gig on a program on public television in San Francisco called Over Easy that started, there was a program for old people, and um, it was a show filmed in front of an uh, audience. And I tell the story in the book about my absolute terror and the first thing that I filmed. The first time I was ever on television, it was, um, I had a seven minute segment, which in television terms is enormous, and it was filmed in front of a live audience. And uh, it was heavily, heavily, heavily re rehearsed, except that the host threw in an extra question that wasn't in the script, and I didn't know what to do. I just completely fell apart. Um, <laughs> it was not a great first experience on television. But by the end, Mary Martin was the host, and she couldn't see the monitor, and she couldn't hear very well, and so it was my job to make her look good, and I could do that. <laughs> could do that. I've never been worried about it ever since. That was trial by fire. It really was. And the first time I ever gave a public lecture was to an audience of 1,200 with Linus Pauling on the podium. <laughs> I mean, I was just kind of thrown into it. I look back thinking, how did I do that? But it was, Terror. But it was amazing. You were a woman and you were doing nutrition, so in a way none of this really should have been happening, but you made it happen because you cared about it. I cared about it a lot. I mean, I thought it was the, just the best thing in the world to teach. I was really interested in why people eat the way they do and how to make diets better. And, you know, I like to eat. And so the, uh, I have a real appreciation for food. I think everybody should have food. And, and I believe that healthy food is, could be delicious. Really, it can. Well, all of these opinions were what got you your next job at the Surgeon General's report, <laughs> which was... Uh, a huge stepping stone and also uh, spiritually the kiss of death, but, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it was a big thing. It was the only job I got. I mean, when everything fell apart at UC San Francisco, which fell apart because my marriage broke up and therefore my legitimacy at the medical school, because remember I came as a trailing spouse, um, that fell apart, and then a new dean came in who kept saying, I don't understand what you're doing here. Um, and so that didn't work. And I, I got very good advice and went back to school and did a master's in public health. And I also wrote a book about nutrition for medical students that occasionally appears on Amazon. Um, and last year, I think in January, I went on. I, I went on to see if there were copies of it available, and there was a copy for nine hundred and thirty dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, really? Don't buy that. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, but yeah, it, uh, a book that it was my first book, and the publisher who published it had a midlife crisis right after my book came out and went and gave up his publishing business and went to music school. 
um, <laughs> went to get a degree in music, and that was the end of my book. But the, you can still get copies for <laughs> of it occasionally on Amazon. Um, uh, yeah, the medical school. Anyway, the, so then I went to I went to Washington to edit the Surgeon General's report on nutrition and health, a job for which I was totally qualified because I had just written this book for medical students, and the Surgeon General's report was just a longer version of that book, really. Um, and that was my experience in Washington. I went there from Berkeley. I didn't understand the difference between Republicans and Democrats. I learned the difference very quickly, <laughs> as one does in Washington. So your, your description of those years in Washington is just so deadening and... Uh, I didn't fit. <laughs> kind of horrifying. <laughs> then you finally get to NYU where you really belong. And then a, uh, comes the year 1991, which to me kind of blazes out of this book. That was the year of the Dietary Pyramid, which uh, because the USDA pulled it, there was a lot of talk about why that had happened and what was going into it, and they, they asked you the questions. You were at NYU, you were a nutrition person, you had a government background, and you also had sources all over Washington who were slipping you the stories. Oh, actually, it was even more pointed than that, because this is where the Washington connection came in. When the Department of Agriculture withdrew the pyramid, um, under pressure from the meat industry. The meat industry was in town when the pyramid was about to be released. Somebody wrote about it and the meat people were not very happy. If you remember the pyramid, it was this food guide and meat was way at the top. They weren't very happy about that. Um, and there, I was interviewed by uh, Malcolm Gladwell, of all people, who was working at the Washington Post at the time. And so I was quoted in his story about this, saying, oh, this is what the meat industry always does. It's always exercising its muscle. And when that story came out, I got a call that night, quite late at night, from a woman I had known in Washington saying, um, you know, the Department of Agriculture is saying that the reason they've withdrawn it is because it was never tested on women women and children, and that's obviously not true. They withdrew it under pressure from the meat industry. We have documents to prove that, but we're not allowed to talk to the press. Do you think you could get these documents to the press? I thought I could probably do that. <laughs> you know, and because I had known Marion Burroughs, who was food writer for the Times, when she was in wa in Washington for, at the working for the Washington Post, I just you know called her and said, "Would you be interested in seeing whatever it is they send me?" And she said, "I certainly would." <laughs> and we were off and running. It was so much fun. I think it really it really started there. That I think that's when your name started getting out all over the place just because you became the quoted source I on all kinds of... I was interviewed by everybody, yeah. absolutely everybody, because I had the documents. Yeah, yeah. So well. it set you up, I and mean, the publication of Food Politics also did this, but this was a kind of the setup where Marion acquired not only the identity, but the kind of life work of kind of you against the food industry. And it was David and Goliath. Now... There are, uh, there are a lot of Davids, a lot of people are talking about the food industry, but Goliath has not gotten any smaller. What are we up against here? Oh, a lot of money. Um, and also, a very, foc a very clear focus. I mean, what strikes me so much about food companies, I mean, they're not evil people. They're not, you know, they're not out to poison the world or to make Americans or anybody else fat. They just have one goal, and that's to sell food products because that's their job, and that's what our economic system requires of corporations is that they not only make a profit but grow their profits, and profits to stake to shareholders are their number one, um, and, and actually their only goal. Everything else is peripheral. So as long as that goal is reached and they're making a, a profit and keeping shareholders happy and growing the profits every 90 days, um, they're doing what they're supposed to do and anything that interferes with that needs to be stopped. 
and it has to be stopped cold. And I keep saying, food companies are not social service agencies. They're not public health agencies. They're businesses, and they have to follow the rules of business. And once you understand that, everything that they're doing makes sense. And that's really what I wrote about in Food Politics, which came out in 2002. And I thought I was stating the obvious. It never occurred to me that nobody else had ever thought of that. Um, and there may have been people who thought of it, but they weren't writing about it much. Now, lots of people are writing about it. Yeah. I remember when that book came out, you said, and you say this in the book, what you really wanted from that book was better invitations. What did you mean? <laughs> <laughs> I wanted three things from that book. I wanted never to go to another nutrition conference and have everybody at the conference moan about what are we going to do to get mothers to feed their children more healthfully. I never wanted to hear that again. What I wanted was to go to conferences and hear people say, how are we going to stop the food industry from marketing junk food to our kids? And convincing our kids that if they don't go to, Mo to McDonald's and we don't take them to McDonald's, we're ruining their childhoods. Um, so that was one, and then I wanted the then American Dietetic Association to stop publishing um, sort of handouts in their journal, which were sponsored by food companies, and you could predict what the handouts would say if you knew who the sponsor was, and if you read the handouts, you could figure out who had paid for them. I thought they should stop doing that, and they did eventually, but not for a long time. Um, and then the third one was I wanted better speaking invitations. Um, I wanted to speak to larger groups and uh, groups that were different from the ones I had been speaking to. And you have to be careful what you ask for, <laughs> because um, you're looking back on, you know, I, I don't have a lot of records uh, of my life. I consider this book my first work of fiction. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, uh, but I did, I did, I do have records of the talks I gave after Food Politics came out, and I was giving 85 talks a year, um, which is a lot if you have a full-time teaching job. And I was chairing a department, although not for long after Food Politics came out. But the, um, yeah, I'm not, I got better speaking invitations. Now I have a lecture agency. Life is much better. <laughs> So food doesn't play, a, a food per se does not play a huge role in this book, but there is one, um, and I haven't asked too much about it, but I do have to mention one of the early childhood meals that obviously made a big impression on you, and that was the one at Chalk Full of Nuts when they gave you a quarter and you were allowed to have a cream cheese on date nut bread sandwich. <laughs> How did this shape your future life? I just thought it was delicious. Cream cheese walnuts on this whatever bread it was. I didn't remember the date nut bread. But I just thought it was the best thing in the world. You get a lot of calories. It's sweet. <laughs> what more could you want? Fat and sugar are very nice combination. Very, very nice. So I also was given money to eat in Chinese restaurants for lunch. And, the, um, and that was good. I, li I like chow mein. So you were not going home for a, like lunch with mom? Sometimes. Sometimes. I don't remember eating in school at all. We were sent home from school. I went to school on 109th Street between Broadway and Amsterdam, PS 45. Uh, the school was 50 years old when I went to it, and um, it's a lot more years later, so it's a, it, it's, it must be a landmarked school at this point. <laughs> Um, when I went to it, it didn't have flush toilets, if you can mm. imagine that. It, there was a, a board with holes in it, oh and, <laughs> and they flushed water through it. Let's get back to chocolate nuts. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. New York was interesting in those days. That was the Upper West Side. <laughs> the other food story in your book is, is an oft-told tale of when you were kind of uh, graciously invited and also kind of forced to uh, to be to dinner with Julia Child <laughs> at her house and uh, <laughs> and and sort of put under a spotlight there. Well, this was Nancy Jenkins' fault. I had met I had met Nancy Jenkins, and Nancy had this idea that if Julia met me, 
she would stop thinking about nutritionists as ruining the world for food, <laughs> um, which she clearly did. She clearly did. And so Nancy arranged this. She said, I'll, you know, I'll have dinner at my house, and Julia will come, and I'll be, we, you'll have dinner with Julia. And, and then I didn't hear anything about it for months and months and months, and it turned out Nancy had broken her foot, and the dinner wasn't going to be at her house. It was going to be at Julia's house. <laughs> I was kind of excited. The very kitchen that's in the Smithsonian right now. Um, and it was just an incredibly uncomfortable evening. I'm, I mean, I w there were several people there, and I walked in, and there was absolute silence, and nobody was smiling. And um, uh, Julia started out by saying, and now Marion will introduce herself. And I thought, oh dear. So I tried to introduce myself and talk about how much I liked food and all of that kind of thing. That got nowhere. And then um, the dinner was uh, the largest steak I've ever been given. <laughs> And there's nothing like a good steak now, is there? <laughs> and I thought, oh, this is so difficult. What am I going to do? I ate it. Um, the, uh, you know, just like, it was like that the whole time. It was very stiff, very formal, extremely uncomfortable. Um, and then I had brought up my copy of Mastering the Art of French Cooking, and you will remember <laughs> that I was involved in competitive home cooking out of this book. And it had pages stuck together with stuff that had gotten on it. It was completely spattered. The pages were, I mean, it was obviously extremely well used. And she wrote something very stiff and formal in it. And it was not a very happy experience. But things got much better after that. But has that, does that still happen? People will have you to dinner, and then they stand around shaking in their shoes? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what are we going to feed her? I eat everything, except brains. I don't want to eat brains. <laughs> um, that, that's my only thing. No, I really like food. And I, that was a very, very difficult evening. And you know, later, I talked to Stephanie. Uh, I, I, was in New, I was in New Zealand, and Stephanie Hirsch, who was Julia's longtime assistant, was living in New Zealand. I think maybe, I don't know whether she still is or not. She may be back. But I said, what was that about? <laughs> And it was exactly that, that she felt like she was being put in this awful position of having to invite somebody to dinner at her house she, who she absolutely didn't want to have anything to do with. And there I was. But things got much better. And I put one of her little love notes in the book. Yes. So. We're going to open this up in a second. I just want to ask one more question. You, you make the astonishing assertion in this book that it never occurred to you that the food movement uh, was uh, sort of riddled with gender politics, that, that, that it was, that it was um, <laughs> basically all about men as, as fast and furious as it could be while the women were doing the work. But, but you said you finally figured that out. Well, I figured it out because somebody sent me a copy of an article from Ms. Magazine that was titled, Why Are the Men Getting All the Credit in the Food Movement? Yeah. And, and that was pretty revelatory. And the woman who wrote it was very nice. And she mentioned Alice Waters and mentioned me. And I thought, well, let, I'm very happy to be in that company. Uh, but she did a, a pretty tough analysis of you know, who was getting all the credit, and the Michael Pollans and Eric Schlossers and, um, uh, and Mark Bittmans of the world, and who I think are doing terrific work, and I don't want to take anything away from them. But Alice is always looked at as somebody ethereal and not to be taken seriously, although anybody who knows Alice knows that Alice gets what Alice wants, um, you know, and has done just amazing things. And everybody on the West Coast is indebted to her in some way or other and everywhere else. Um, but I had never really thought about it. You know, I mean, it just uh, part of it was that having been brought up in the 1950s, when women were never expected to do anything, I wouldn't have expected anything else. That's, that's how the game is played. You know, and you try to work around it. But I remember when uh, when Michael Pollan published the Omnivore's Dilemma, which is a great book, and he did a wonderful job, and he's done nothing but good 
for the food world, but uh, I was wondering, and I'm sure you were, wait a minute, all these women have already said that. You said it, Joan <laughs> Gusso said it, right. a lot of people said it. Right. So again, when the guy says it, it, it yeah. went across. Yes, he's gotten much more generous <laughs> since psychedelics. <laughs> that's what everybody tells me. That's what I, that's the word that's out. <laughs> We, we should all do that, yes. <laughs> and we'll be more generous too. <laughs> so let's let's uh, hear from you how all. How can you how can you tell? You can't see anybody. Oh, I see I see oh, a hand can. right here. Marion, it's Joan. Hi, Hi. Joan. <laughs> um, a question, please. You were invited by Klaus Schwab to speak at Davos, and you did so. What did you speak about? to heads of state and global CEOs? Oh dear. <laughs> the World Economic Forum. I've been to the World Economic Forum twice. And the first time I went, um, first of all, I didn't speak to heads of state. So let me explain <laughs> that. Well, the first time I went, um, my ex-husband, um, who had been to Davos said, oh, he said, you're being sent as part of the entertainment for the wives. Um, because, because, um, he said, you know, the heads of state bring all these wives along and the um, and they need something to do so there's all these there are all these panel discussions and events that are taking place that the people who are not the movers and shakers um, can go to and that's what I was doing there he was I was enormously offended and he was absolutely right he was absolutely right so Davos is divided into tiers and the top tier is the movers and shakers and the, um, you know, the glamorous movie stars and music people, the Bonos and Angelina uh, Jolies, who was there the, the time I was there. And, and you never meet those people. Um, and in fact, you don't even know where they're going. You don't get invited. I mean, I don't know how you get invited to anything there. Um, but at my level, it was still kind of fun. I mean, there were a lot of people there, and it's interesting to see it. And if you could figure out how to get into things, which I didn't, there's an electronic thing. I'm a little electronically challenged. It was very, very hard to figure out how to register to get into, into things. But it was fun, and I was on panels and met interesting people and watched some jaw-dropping sessions, really jaw-dropping sessions. Um, and the, um, you know, and so it was, it was sort of fun. And the first time I went, I thought, well, this really wasn't a very good use of my time. <laughs> and then I was invited again 12 years later and tried it again. It was the same story. <laughs> so, um, I mean, there may be people who go and they go to very important meetings, but uh, the, the general run of the mill people who are invited are, are there on a much, much lower level. Well, it's really class-based, and I, I never could figure out how it worked. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> yes. You said that you didn't like praise. Yes. What other, what other parts do you not like? Like ears, snout, <laughs> Well, I, I don't tongue. Most people don't serve those. <laughs> But brains get served, oh, and I'm worried about you know prion diseases. So I just assume not. So yes. Okay. Oh, hi. hi. Um, I was really struck by what you said about the students not being able to research and write mm -hmm. anymore. And you know, I've up until a couple of months ago, I've been living in rural Australia, and. Since I've been back, I've been really struck by the young people here and the incessant phones. I get mm. on the elevator. <laughs> I, honestly, I don't think one time in the nine weeks I've been back, I get on the elevator with them, and they're all like this. And they walk around like this all the time. And I just wonder, I've genuinely wondered what impact that has on their brains and their ability to sort of function in a way that, 
you know, do they have conversations with people? What do they think about? <laughs> I mean, this is really, it's yeah, really it's struck me concern. because mm -hmm. in country Australia, the young people, of course, they have phones and probably even in the cities too, but it's not this incessant in the face. And I just wonder what you think about that and your teaching capacity and whether what kind of impact that might have on them. Well, I don't know anybody who's teaching who isn't complaining that students can't do the work, um, that they can't do the work, they can't get anything in on time, um, they're unable to manage it, the, half of them are signed up with the disability office, um, they want extra time to get assignments in. I mean, there's really been a break, what looks to me like a breakdown in mental health, particularly since the pandemic. I'm not teaching now, so I don't have any personal experience with it, but I have heard this from absolutely everybody. And I think everybody's worried about the impact of phones on people who don't, you know, who didn't grow up in a different, oh boy, that's really tough, uh, who didn't grow up in a, in, a, in a different way so that they have a different relationship with phones. Um, and you know, if you're on it all the time, I, there's been lots written about the effect of phones on, um, you know, on girls particularly, young girls particularly, but on everybody. You know, everything has to be quick. Um, Oh, Meryl, hello. <laughs> hello. Um, so, so thank you for, for this conversation and for this conversation. I'm so excited to dive into. For those of us who have known, admired, and cherished you for so many years, it's really a revelation to uh, that, that you're sharing these many more personal sides of yourself. And that can be true, it can't be more true for anyone more than your children, so I'm interested in your kids' reaction to this book and the revelations in it. Well, I was very careful writing it um, to leave them out and also to leave out the ex-husband who's still alive and on whom I'm on very, very good terms, and I want to keep it that way. Um, the, so it's not, they're referred to obliquely they, I don't know, Laura. What do you think? They're not. They don't. They're not characters they in this. About me that, that oh, you want to know what they said? <laughs> <laughs> um, they said almost nothing. They they said, oh, we learned some things about you, um, but there was never much in the way. I gave them an early draft to read. Um, I didn't want to have anything in there that would embarrass them or be difficult for them. I mean, they're adults. Um, I, they're, as I put it, they're older than I am. The, uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, so uh, they really had very little to say. That's interesting. I'll ask them. I'll say I got one of the questions I got asked was, and I'll be very interested to hear what they say about that. Um, and my ex-husband has read it, and he told me that he read it, but he also has not commented. Um, so, I don't know. No, you, you, were, you were super careful about that, and I remember when you were writing it, you were oh, very it concerned. Issue. It was a big issue for me, uh, was that I really, uh, I mean, and, and there, are, there are a couple of people I talk about in the book that I'm also a little worried about, but when I tell people that, they say, why do you care what he thinks? <laughs> you know, I think, well, mm, all right, that's a good question. <laughs> and besides, the more you leave sort of uh, undercovered, the more your future biographers will have to do. Uh, the, right. This is not, you know, memoirs are not biographies. And that got hammered into me right at the beginning. I read a lot of memoirs. I talked to people who write memoirs and teach how to write memoirs. And that's the one thing that they just pound into you, that this is not biography. Um, this is how you remember things that happen, whether it's accurate. That's why I say it's a work of fiction. The, um, I mean, I tried to make it you know, I write nonfiction, so I tried to make this as nonfiction as I possibly could. Um, but uh, there were certain things I just really didn't want to talk about. And I didn't want to talk about marriages. I didn't want to talk about people, you know, that I was involved with. I didn't want to talk about any of that. And so that's not there. And 
the book went through an astonishing amount of editing, more than anything else I've ever written. The press didn't think I could write a memoir, so they got a really fancy editor to take a really tough look at it. She didn't change much, as it turned out, but she did whenever there was a place where she said, I, you know, I really think you've got to, where was your husband while this was going on? So I would say, you know, I could figure out some way of saying, well, we weren't getting along at that and, and leave it at that. But yes, I mean, it's interesting. You know, they haven't said anything. I'm going to have to ask them. <laughs> I think we have time for one or two more, yes. Um, Hi, I'm Patty and Trader. <laughs> nice to see you. I was wondering how you got the idea to write food politics. It was, was it coming out of Washington, D.C. and that environment, or was there something else? Well, that's a question I answer in the book. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was, a, there was an epiphany that occurred er, in the early 90s where actually it had to do with anti-smoking advocates and I went to presentations by anti-smoking advocates who showed lots and lots of pictures of cigarette marketing. And I knew that cigarette companies marketed. I even knew that cigarette companies marketed to children. I just had never paid any attention to it. It was part of the landscape. And I walked out of that meeting saying, we should be doing this for Coca-Cola. And that's how it started. So I started writing articles. And then when I finally figured out that NYU valued books and that we now had food studies and food studies was a humanities program and humanities people write books, I could write a book instead of articles. I put articles together into a book and that became Food Politics and the one that came out a year later, Safe Food. That was the genesis of it. But, but I tell the whole story in great <laughs> detail. <laughs> Yes, let's have one. Good evening. Um, what advice would you give to those of us who are recent MPH graduates uh, wanting to make an impact in the world of food policy? Um, find an organization to work with or find an institution to work with. Um, if you're, you know, it, are, you still in public, are you still in public health school? You're out. Done. You're done. <laughs> you're done. Um, yeah, I was going to say, if you had an internship opportunity, you know, I was forced to do internships when I was in public health school. It was the best thing I ever did. Um, but look for, if you want power to do something, work for a city health agency. You know, there, uh, all of the city, certainly the New York agency is really concerned about not enough food, too much food, chronic disease. And they really are, have all these programs going. Join up with one of them. They're doing great work. Or, or join an advocacy group. The big problem is getting paid for it. So you have to, you have to go someplace where you can get paid. Um, and that's a huge problem in food movement, just an enormous problem. And it's the one that I'm most worried about because you know, food industry companies, they have lobbyists. They pay them a lot of money to make sure that nobody does anything that's gonna harm their ability to make a profit. Um, but for advocates, it's really tough to get paid. So look for a paying job with an agency. <laughs> Good advice. Mm -hmm. Yes. I know you were at the White House conference last week. I was. <laughs> know coming out of that what you're most optimistic about and how we can all take action individually and collectively okay I didn't come out of the White House conference very optimistic the um, first of all I I have to tell you I was invited Sunday night at nine o'clock and the meeting started on Wednesday <laughs> I had a very last minute invitation and I thought should I not go? And then I thought, no, I'm going to go. Um, it, it was the worst organized conference I've ever been to, bar none. So there was a reason why I was invited Sunday night at 9. Um, and it was terrific on hunger. And if there's anything to be optimistic about, it's that this administration will really do something about hunger if Congress will let it. Um, 
And of course, we don't know what's going to happen with the election. But I thought the hunger, the focus on hunger was clear. It was laser-like. And everybody was united that we need universal school meals. We need more uh, benefits for people who are on food assistance. Um, all of those things were really clear, focused, unambiguous, with lots of evidence to back it up. And everybody was on the same page. Nobody was talking. I mean, there was a lot of lip service paid to diet-related chronic disease. And I thought it was thrilling to hear the President of the United States use the words diet-related chronic <laughs> disease. I never thought I'd live that long. Um, <laughs> The, so that was very exciting, but what they meant by diet-related chronic disease was in poor people. They didn't mean the population as a whole. So nobody is talking about doing anything about overnutrition, obesity, obesity-related chronic diseases, um, and the high risk for heart disease, uh, diabetes, cancer, high blood pressure, death, and COVID. You know, that comes with it. Nobody is talking about that. It was, except for Cory Booker, he was the only one. And even he was focusing, focusing in on uh, people who were poor. So I think it's great that that focus was there, but what about everybody else? Uh, I was concerned about that. And of course, they can't talk about that without talking about restrictions on food company marketing, and nobody wants to take that on. So I'm not very optimistic. I, I think there's a good chance I hope there's a good chance that we'll get school, universal school meals out of this, but it's lo not looking that, all that good right now. But there was one person, you know, there was the president. Oh, they did one wonderful thing. They had lived experience. That was wonderful. So they had people with lived experience of being on food stamps or food assistance um, come and talk about their experience on all of on every panel, and the woman who introduced President Biden was somebody who had been on food stamps as a child and been on food assistance through a lot of her life, but her name wasn't in the program. There was no printed. There was no printed program. There was no printed program for this meeting. And the, um, and it, the only reason I was able to find out her name was somebody had mentioned it on Twitter. Uh, so, I don't know, complicated. But the hunger focus was good. Will something become of it? Don't know. We'll find out. I'm not hugely optimistic. Any more? Yes. But um, given your Kurt, your answer that you're not optimistic, because uh, my initial question was about whether you had optimism that anything was going to change with the food companies basically shaping our food environment um, so that we naturally eat unhealthy <laughs> foods, right, or ultra processed foods. Um, but I just want to pivot a little bit. I recently heard um, Mayor Eric Adams um, mm -hmm. speak during Climate Week NYC. Um, at our World Resources Institute event, and um, he talked about his personal experience with, um, you know, diet-related chronic disease mm -hmm. and his mother's, and he is doing a lot in, in New York City um, to introduce food as medicine, to mm -hmm. change what food is served in the hospitals, um, and I, I, what concerns me, I think that's all great, but it's really thinking about how our food environment is is shaping our future eaters. And I know he's introducing ideas like plant-based Fridays, I think, and NYC schools, um, but what else can we be doing so that we can shape future eaters to naturally choose healthy foods? Get them gardens. You know, I mean, here's Alice Waters again. Everybody thought Alice Waters was crazy when she said she wanted gardens in schools. Schools don't meet during the summer. Gardens grow in the summer. Um, and yet, I think there are thousands and thousands of schools now that have gardens. And there's some in New York, and I've seen them. They're amazing. They completely change kids' relationship with food. Absolutely, it's just phenomenal. Not everybody, but most. I mean, I went to one school in Harlem that had, that had gardens, and there were 20 teenage boys 
eating, you know, harvesting salad and making salads and eating salads. And two of the 18 re were sitting like this and they weren't going to touch it. And I watched this kid across the table from me who wasn't eating his salad and was looking very unhappy. And somebody came up, one of the other kids came up and asked him if he was going to eat it. And he said, no. And he said, can I have it? And I thought, this program is a success. <laughs> you know, it's a success. So school gardens, teaching kids how to cook is how you do it. Um, and as for what to do about the food environment, you've got, you need advocacy. I mean, this is where advocacy comes in. And I want to see, there are thousands of organizations, of food organizations, that are working on doing really fabulous work. Could they please unite around common goals and maybe have a little political power? That would be nice. So go out and organize. I think that's our time. Thank you all, and thank you, Mary. Thank you very much for coming.